Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to the uh, Innovation Consensus Conference. I'm glad you can join us today. And uh, this is a conference that's co-sponsored by ITIF, Silicon Flatirons, and the Technology Policy Institute. So I want to thank my, my colleagues and partners in crime here, Tom Leonard from CPI and, and John Sallett from uh, Silicon Flatirons. So we've got a really gr great program today. There's been a little bit of change. Uh, a couple of the members, unfortunately, have votes, but I think we've been able to reorganize a little bit. Should be a really great uh, show at, and event at the end. But what I wanted to do just before we get started here, each of the three of us are just going to make two minute, very quick comments, and then we'll hear from uh, Senator Chris Coons. Um, but I think the first thing, really, any conference on innovation is really have to talk about what is innovation. And I think that one of the problems with the debate and the dialogue on innovation is it tends to be way, way too narrow. Innovation is seen as the, uh, as, as the iPad or uh, the, the you know, human genome or uh, big data analytics, drug breakthroughs, and those are all pretty critical innovations. But innovation is also uh, the oil and gas industry using a, a supercomputer to analyze uh, uh, oil and gas formations. Uh, innovation is uh, Boeing creating a wide-body uh, 787 out of, out of composite materials. Uh, innovation is, uh, is using self-checkout at the grocery store. It's a way to have retail trade that we've never had before. So uh, innovation is all about advanced animation in movies. And so our point as putting on this conference is that innovation is really permeating American society and it's going to be central to our future standards of living. And that really gets to the next point, which is why we want to focus on innovation. And I think there's really two big reasons for that, is the literature is very clear on this, that innovation is the dominant driver of U.S. productivity and per capita income growth. Uh, you can find studies as high as 90% uh, uh, related to innovation. Most studies are in the 50 to 60 to 70% range of per, per capita income growth coming from innovation. And the second point is that innovation is really the source of U.S. competitive advantage. It's, uh, it's not going to be natural resources. It's not going to be low-wage commodity production. It's going to be doing things that other countries can't do very well, and it's going to be doing them more efficiently, and that's really what innovation is all about. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to John for a few quick comments. Good morning. Thank you, Rob. Um, Thanks, Thank you, Rob, for your leadership. Thanks for helping me working your microphone. Uh, no, I want to thank Rob particularly. Nobody put in as much work in organizing the conference and making it as successful as it's going to be than Rob, who's been a leader on these issues for years, who thinks hard and makes us all understand better how innovation works, and also the staff of IPIF who's worked so hard on this event. Uh, I'm a senior fellow at Silicon Flatirons. We work, I'm in D.C., but the center at, in Boulder at the University of Colorado Law School works to further understanding of innovation, impact on economic growth, but also works to promote business creation in the local community in Colorado, in Boulder and around Boulder. And I think there's a story there that's perhaps the hidden story of innovation in America today. We talk about what happens at the national level, and we should. But we need to pay more attention to what happens at the state and local level. Places where governors of different political parties, mayors, local businesses are working together, not being confined by partisan differences, but finding the kind of common ground and consensus of which we will speak today. Look around the country. I've been reading recently about work in clusters. I, I do work in regional innovation clusters. So what are the stories that come from places like Michigan, from Ohio, from New Jersey, in sectors that are manufacturing or services or software or agriculture, to Rob's point about the nature of innovation. And what they are is practical, and they're practically minded. And therefore, they're focused on outcomes, building businesses, finding more jobs, <coughs> making communities stronger in a way that is so intensely practical that it gets beyond ideological boundaries. In fact, Gallup poll did a survey last fall and asked Americans, who do you think can do the best job of creating jobs in America? And the political leaders who topped the list were mayors and governors. And they were accompanied by local businesses. 
And so, as we go through the day today, I just ask that we concentrate not just on federal policy, as important as that is, but in the way in which communities, universities, businesses, community colleges, NGOs, in the local and regional level, are every day doing the work that makes America stronger and that we need to understand better to get federal policy right. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Tom Leonard, uh, president of the Technology Policy Institute, and uh, I want to also welcome you here today. And it's a pleasure to be partnering with uh, with uh, ITIF and with uh, Silicon Flatirons to discuss this uh, quickly important set of issues. And I want to also thank uh, both Rob and John, basically for doing all the all the heavy lifting in uh, in organizing this conference. Um, as we all know, innovation and technical change are really crucial to uh, the United States competitiveness and to, to our ability to deliver, uh, deliver uh, healthy growth rates, uh, improve standards of living, and uh, provide uh, well-paying jobs. And for much of our history, and this is certainly so in the recent past, uh, we've led the way and produced really a record of uh, innovation and growth and productivity improvement has, uh, has been the envy of the world. And, uh, in the last couple of decades, the U.S. has been the birthplace of, uh, of revolutions in, uh, in infra information and, uh, and biotechnology and uh, of, the, of the great companies that, uh, uh, that have uh, symbolized those, uh, those uh, uh, revolutions, everything from uh, uh, Microsoft, Intel, the Google, the Amgen, Genentech, but, but as Rob indicated, innovation is a lot broader than that. It includes uh, entertainment, movies, records, books. It includes uh, retailing. Think of Walmart and Starbucks. It includes the development of uh, new business models and, and, and really a host of industries. Um, there is now concern uh, that uh, our leadership position in uh, innovation uh, may be in jeopardy. Uh, I don't think it's uh, unusual or um, surprising that such concerns arise uh, during recessions, during economic times like the one we're in now. Um, but before considering um, the, the pros and cons of various policy proposals, we really need to have an accurate picture of where we are. I mean, do we, in fact, have an innovation problem? If so, what is the nature of the problem and what are the causes? However, regardless of, the, of whether we have an innovation problem per se, uh, there, I think, is room, or should be room, for uh, consensus on, uh, on policies that are pro-innovation. For example, I don't think anybody thinks that, uh, have, that having uh, the highest corporate tax rate in the world is particularly beneficial for innovation. I don't think anybody thinks that, um, you know, that uh, <coughs> sending, uh, sending talented immigrants uh, uh, back home or to other countries that have uh, more friendly immigration policies is particularly good for innovation. So I think there's a lot of room for things that can be good, to, for policies that are good for innovation, regardless of whether we have a problem per se. But in any event, uh, I think we have a great program lined up. Uh, I look forward to listening to, uh, to all the speakers and to uh, at the discussion. And now I think give it back to Rob. Okay, thanks, Tom. So um, I want to uh, get right into the program. Introduce our first uh, keynote speaker, uh, Senator Chris Coons. Senator Coons was elected uh, in the last election to the U.S. Senate from the state of Delaware. He serves on the uh, Foreign Relations Committee, Judiciary, Energy, and Budget. He was actually the only freshman uh, to be named as a subcommittee chair when he was named chair of the Foreign Relations Subcommittee on African Affairs. Uh, prior to that, uh, prior to being in the Senate, uh, Senator Coons was the chief executive of Newcastle County, which is the largest county in Delaware, and prior to that was uh, six years as the county chief executive. Uh, and prior to that, he was an attorney uh, and worked for the W.L. Gore Associates Company, which you all know for the most famous product, which is Gore-Tex, 
Uh, and I think uh, Senator Coons is probably the only member of the Senate who has both a chemistry degree and a degree from Yale Divinity School. So uh, that's sort of some ability to think spiritually about innovation challenges for the nation. And, and uh, also, I've had the great pleasure of knowing Senator Coons uh, in, in his current life and also his prior life and really have, have really respected his work on economic growth and innovation. And I, uh, to, to, to the point, uh, recently I got an email from one of the Senator's staffers saying, um, the Senator is providing, presiding over the Senate uh, now, and he was just reading one of your reports and he had a question about it. And I wasn't sure what that really indicated, whether our reports are really, really great or whether presiding over the Senate is really, really boring. But I think really what it meant was that the Senator is committed and really interested and deeply committed to these issues. So please join me in welcoming Senator Chris Coons. Well, good morning, Rob, and uh, thank you for that great introduction. And I think uh, what my comment indicated was both the presiding of the Senate is a challenge to somnolence uh, and an opportunity for great reflection when you've got insightful and meaningful content that you can work with, such as the reports that come out of ITIF. I actually read your emails. Uh, in the torrent of emails I get from lots of different groups and lots of different organizations, I always find something actionable, useful, insightful from ITIF's work. Uh, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be with all of you this morning. I was uh, interested to hear as well uh, from Tom at TPI and from John at Melvin and Myers, I was unaware of silicon flat irons um, and was very interested by your opening comments uh, and by what it may bring to regional integration of uh, innovation um, sort of ecosystems around the country. Uh, it's something, as Rob mentioned, that I worked hard on in 10 years in county government. Perhaps my natural inclination towards bipartisanship and I think an effort to find reasonable solutions around manufacturing and innovation and skills and infrastructure comes from uh, a rooting both in the private sector uh, in a very innovative, rapidly growing, high technology, materials-based science company and in delivering local services, something which, as Rob mentioned, is at its core not ideological. There really isn't a Republican or a Democratic way uh, to improve response time by police or to deliver better sewer services or to finance improving park and library systems. Um, these are the sorts of blocking and tackling jobs that help make local communities safer and stronger and help in very meaningful ways to contribute to our competitiveness nationally and globally. Uh, but just to agree at the outset uh, with Rob's characterization, while we talk a lot about competitiveness these days, and there are lots of things that contribute to competitiveness, the skills of your workforce, your monetary policy, the modernization of your infrastructure, it is innovation that has and should be at the core of American competitiveness policy because it is innovation at which we have uniquely excelled and where we need to continue to modernize our tax policy, our monetary policy, our work at research institutions, our work in the federal government, and the relationship between the public sector and private sector. If we successfully continue to endurably foster innovation, we can remain a highly competitive country. And I think this is going to be at the heart of what is the most important thing, I think, for all of my constituents and for the folks across this country, which is not just slowly bending the arc of this recovery and slowly restoring uh, our growth rate to what it was before, but laying the very real foundation uh, for long-term innovation in through that competitiveness. Uh, one of the things, Rob, I know ITIF's worked on that I'm very interested in and that JJ and my folks are, are following closely is the patent box, an idea for how um, to mimic some success in other countries in Europe of licensing and encouraging not just innovation and invention here, but then tying it to manufacturing, to practice, to actual implementation of intellectual property and innovation here in the United States. That is a great, in my view, idea. And you've got a terrific agenda here today uh, of folks who will be addressing all the different constituent uh, components of what is a good conversation. Can we, in fact, harness the American people uh, and what I believe to be their gut appreciation of the centrality of inventing things here and making them here and the drivers of innovation in the political conversation that will happen between now and November and in God willing the political action, the actual legislating that may happen uh, between the election uh, and the end of this year. Uh, is it possible for all of us to come up with policy ideas that are compelling enough uh, that they can move us forward? In the year and a half that I've been a senator, uh, I have not seen the sort of river of legislative movement that I had hoped for, the sort of tectonic plates shifting, the 
kind of 2012 Mayan calendar movie moment in which we sort of break apart these long-standing uh, sources of tension and actually move forward. Instead, we've had, if, if anything, it's been more like the movie Ice Age, where the movement is glacial uh, and the chamber often chilly. Um, so it is my hope that we will find not just ideas, but also people uh, willing to bend themselves and their political trajectories uh, towards a common agenda. We have gotten a few big things done. The America Competes Act and its focus on STEM and on innovation, I think, was of some real value. We've made some progress on infrastructure with the FAA reauthorization and the infrastructure bill, which sadly, although passed out of the Senate by a strong bipartisan margin, sits today in the House. The Jobs Act, which helps with accelerating capital formation for early stage companies, uh, and with the America Invents Act, but which I think strengthened our patent system and intellectual property protections. Um, but we have to do more, and we have to do more to move forward. I've got five different areas uh, where I'm working and hope to be legislating on investing in an educated workforce with my American Dream Accounts so Act, opening global markets. I am the Africa Subcommittee Chair and really focusing on the huge opportunity of the African market uh, for our export growth for the long term. Finding new ways to finance clean energy, uh, taking master limited partnerships and trying to make them accessible to all forms of energy, listening to the argument of the Republicans that we shouldn't pick winners and losers, we should have an all of the above energy strategy, and so taking a long-standing vehicle and opening it up uh, to all the different sources uh, of power generation, and then finding ways to protect America's inventions uh, through strengthening trade secret protection. But I want to talk in a little detail about uh, the fifth area that I'm interested in, which is reforming the Arnie tax credit. As in-house counsel to W.L. Gorn Associates, one of the things I came to Washington to occasionally advocate for was making the already tax credit more usable, more sensible. Frankly, uh, simply at that point, many of us were here advocating for permanency uh, because the already tax credit as practiced over the last decade is sort of perfectly bad tax policy. It expires, it's restored, it expired, it's restored, often retroactively. It's complicated and it really doesn't incentivize innovation and investment in R&D in anything like the ways I think it was intended to and anything like the ways it should. It is a relatively expensive tax expenditure and my concern is that in the ongoing sort of effort to eliminate all tax expenditures, the R&D credit may in fact go away because there are some in the major corporations that benefit from it who say it's such an effort, it's so unreliable, it is not a huge amount of money for us, and this is in the case of multi-billion dollar companies, that they may not see its enduring value. The idea is simple. The R&D tax credit is not accessible to early stage or startup companies. Exactly those companies that have the highest growth potential, both for job creation and for income creation. Exactly those companies that go from five to 50 to 500 employees in their first decade and that are often investing furiously in R&D and in applied R&D that generates new products, new innovation, new jobs. Um, so finding a way to innovate in the R&D tax credit and instead make it a startup innovation credit so that it is accessible as a credit rather than simply something you can only access once you are profitable. What I think can prove it, a GAO report says half the credit currently goes to companies with more than a billion dollars in sales. I have nothing against companies with more than a billion dollars in sales. But to exclude early stage companies is in my view uh, to lock the R&D credit in what it has been rather than what it could be and should be. And my hope is that in the end we'll find a compromise where uh, we may have to shave the rate, make it permanent, and broaden the base by making it accessible through making it a credit so that a much broader range of companies are able to access it. Part of what this proposal does is listen to the concerns uh, and the arguments of the other party. Uh, it's technology neutral. This is not a clean energy credit. This is not a, a biotechnology <coughs> credit. It is not technology specific. It is a way to help sustain investment through the tax code, through tax expenditures, <coughs> in innovation, in R&D. I am grateful for ITIF support for this idea, for its hard work in uh, the, the details of the policy, and I am hopeful uh, that when introduced it will garner broad support and that it is one of the sort of common sense ideas we may be able to move forward this year. You know, frankly, uh, getting over our partisan differences and finding a way to move forward, not just after the election but from now to then, is one of the things that I think is most important for us to do in Congress to send a signal to the markets, to folks around the world, uh, to folks who represent companies and institutions uh, that have a whole lot of stranded capital currently sitting on the sidelines waiting to see 
Who will emerge from the current morass, the sort of economic stagnation or the turbulence in global markets? And I think we have a moment of enormous opportunity ahead of us were we to but seize that moment. Later today, I believe you'll hear from Senators Warner and Moran, um, two folks who've done a great job of pairing up in that arc-like, you know, go in two by two, pairing that's required to get any bill uh, meaningfully considered in the Senate these days. Um, they had a good and strong uh, early introduction of the bill. So too did I with Marco Rubio. Some of you may know Senator Rubio of Florida. Um, the only thing I presumed we had in common when I first arrived was that we both owed our election to the Tea Party. <laughs> but in somewhat different ways. <laughs> but I discovered as I spent more time with him um, something that is more akin to how the Senate worked in decades past than in days of today, which is that the fact that he has four young children in Miami to whom he desperately wants to return every Thursday, and that I have three young children in Wilmington to whom I eagerly return every night if I possibly can, brought, gave us something more in common than folks perhaps at different places in their lives and in their trajectories and in their careers. As I realized his intellect and his capability, I decided I wanted to study up on this fellow. So I actually found he, in his leadership role in Florida, had written a book that was assembled of ideas that he pulled together from town hall meetings all over the state of Florida, found a copy, it was secondhand, on Amazon.com, bought it, read it, and concluded that there were a dozen good ideas in that book, which I too could sign my name to. There were some I, dis I significantly disagreed with. And there remain things about his political values and views that I strongly disagree with. But there is enough in common that I decided we could and should sit down and hammer out some common agreement. So in one of these particularly frustrating long nights where literally nothing was getting done, and neither of us seemed likely to be going home to our children any day soon, we each challenged the other to read the other's jobs proposal that he committed he would go and read the core of the president's jobs proposal, which at that time was what was sort of floundering on the floor, failing to get past a filibuster. And I promised I would read a number of proposals that had come over from the House and that the Senate was not taking up. And out of that began a proposal where each of our staff started meeting and negotiating, and we went from 50 proposals to 10 to 3, back to 6 to 7 to 5, and ultimately introduced the AGREE Act, which by its acronym is intended to convey the core message, which is there are things we can and should agree on that are common proposals across the two parties and across the two chambers. And oddly enough, they tend to center on what makes us competitive as a country, and they tend to be centered around innovation. The startup innovation credit, which I referenced, the R&D credit modernization, is one of the proposals which, as we work together with Warner and Moran to craft a sort of Act Two to the AGREE Act, um, we are hoping to, in combination, introduce another version of this. The Jobs Act took some pieces of the work that the four of us had done previously. Our hope is to pick up those that are worthy of ongoing consideration, take the fact that I think the White House enjoyed actually having a bill signing ceremony, which a bill was signed, and that the broad response of much of the business and innovation and investment communities was positive, and see if we can find another way to move forward. Let me, if I can, speak briefly about the global situation we find ourselves in and then take questions. I think this is a critical moment for us. And unfortunately, most political conversation focuses on the negative, focuses on how absolutely divided we are, how entrenched our interests are, and how we've made promises here, and you've made promises here, and we can't get over ourselves. As I heard Tony Blair say rather eloquently, I think the accent helps on Morning Joe this morning. Europe, the future of the Eurozone, the survival of the single currency, is caught, as he put it, in a contest between politics and mathematics. Or as I like to say, Greece, currently a ward of the German state, has a math problem, whereas the United States has a leadership problem. The Eurozone is yet again this week back in the soup with um, a spike in the interest rates that the Spanish uh, bond uh, issuance is facing. I think they're up to a six percentage point rate. And we are yet again in a moment where the Eurozone has to re, re, restructure a balance, sort of TARP 5, kind of the Rocky 5 of the Eurozone. And the question there is, can they avoid not just recession, but disintegration as an integrated economic unit, something they have worked so hard on over the decades? And as we look over the horizon in the other direction, China is routinely cited as this sort of emerging giant that will inevitably eclipse us um, economically and in terms of innovation. And if you haven't paid attention to the fact that China both uh, granted more patents and graduated more engineers 
in the last year than we did, and has eclipsed us as the major trading partner of Africa, I think all of these factors are worth paying some attention to. But the very deep underlying difficulties in the Chinese economy, that they've sustained 10 percentage point growth year after year after year, and simply can't keep doing that, that there are enormous problems in their outmoded system of local governance, of financing, the potential of a housing bubble, corruption which is endemic throughout their system, and ways in which their state-owned banks are channeling resources into hugely inefficient state-owned firms. There's a lot of issues, environmental, um, cultural, and political, which I think pose huge challenges to them. The United States faces none of these challenges. We are a single currency. We solved that 200 years ago, although there are some in the Congress today who want to relitigate that question. We have an incredible infrastructure. We have an amazing national resource in terms of our national labs, our research universities, our, our big industry and its investment in R&D. We have a lot of the things from our legal system to our political system that can and should be aligned and move in the right direction. It is but a leadership challenge. And we already know what most of the components of the solution are. Yesterday in the budget committee on which I served, Chairman Conrad laid down Bull Simpson which has been sitting out there for a year now. A hundred page blueprint hammered out by a tough, broad, bipartisan group of insightful budgetary leaders. Everybody around the table agreed that we all hate it, which is probably a good indicator that it's a great framework to start from. Because it achieves $4 trillion in savings over a decade, and it makes cuts all across the board, yet saves the critical investments that are essential to innovation. And if we can but get over ourselves, and hammer out the basics of a framework for resolving our budgetary impasse. I'm convinced that the rest of the world will send its capital here, that we will restore not just our inventions, but also our manufacturing and our global leadership in innovation, in politics, in culture, and in inspiring the rest of the world in an absolutely critical moment. So with that, thank you for the opportunity to be with you this morning, and I look forward to your questions. Great, so if folks have questions, you just want to raise your hand, quickly identify yourself. Probably a time, just maybe two or three. So we am going to go right here, sir, and then right here. Yes, sir, my name is Jack Larson. I'm from the U.S. Government Accountability Office. I have a two-part question. One is, have you thought of all about nanotechnology um, in innovation? And the second question is, have you thought about unintended consequences of new products and or innovative ways, innovative new ways, Fascinating question. Have I thought at all about nanotechnology, if I heard you right, and am I cognizant of the possibility of unintended consequences of new technology? Um, the company for which I worked um, was operating in what popularly for quite a while became described as nanotechnology decades before the term was widely used, meaning manipulating the material products uh, of uh, novel uh, materials and uh, devices at the nano level. Uh, that's essentially the essence of the genius of, of Gore-Tex, is that uh, whether in catalytic reduction filtration for uh, coal-fired power plants or in implantable medical devices, it's changing the actual material properties of the substrate um, in lots of different ways that then has dramatic consequences for everything from conduct conductivity, a, a substrate, uh, when, when we were using it as an impregnated motherboard for high-speed computers to making it actually an effective uh, material for catalytically reducing dioxins and purines. So I am minimally familiar with nanotechnology and some of its potential. Um, I do think that it has gone through a, a phase of being what everyone talks about and is back now to more the province of real scientists and researchers. Um, and I do think that we can and should deliver stronger, more predictable, and more robust regulatory regimes um, for studying in advance the potential unintended human and environmental consequences and harms of nanotechnology. Um, that is an exceptionally difficult thing to do, um, but I think we, we have to. Um, there are a variety of areas in which technology is rocketing forward, whether it's genetically modified crops uh, or it's new compounds um, that have enormous uh, potential in crop protection. Uh, or whether it's new materials that allow us to do things in implantable medical devices, <coughs> the exact consequences of which are unknown and unknowable, um, but the broad consequences of which can and should be studied. I hope I answered your question. So, right over here. Yeah. 
regarding education. Uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, Earth Institute, Columbia University, uh, recently wrote about and has spoken about the mismatch between the skill sets that are out there in general in the American public and the job opportunities that are there. He's identified a number, roughly 750,000 jobs, but there's a mismatch in terms of skill sets and capability. What do you suppose would be a public policy that is practical without picking the winners and losers, as you mentioned before, to uh, enable the United States to uh, capture a lot more in the way of that higher end skill set? A great question that deserves a longer answer than I'll give you now. Um, you know, first, at the simplest level, uh, this is an area I hope to be legislating in, uh, we need to change some of our current practices in terms of visas. There are some limitations in terms of who can come, who can stay. Uh, I do think it's crazy uh, that we educate thousands of uh, high-performing, high-promise uh, masters and PhD level folks in STEM degrees and then force them to leave and go back to their home countries and compete with us. Uh, I really think we ought to be stapling green cards to STEM PhDs and allowing people to stay here when they have uh, credible opportunities to be employed here. I hear from CEOs over and over that they have thousands of jobs they cannot fill. Broadly, we graduate twice as many general business or liberal arts uh, degrees at the bachelor's level than we need, and half as many STEM or engineering graduates who are US nationals as we need. I think we have to go back down the, uh, the value chain and help connect math and science teachers, STEM educators, at the elementary and middle school level to what is really the potential in the marketplace, help parents understand what the long-term marketplace looks like, and strengthen the ecosystem of excitement and engagement around STEM for young people. Uh, I'm trying to pull together a, a statewide um, science fair process, and I know science fair, for those of you who grew up in it, uh, may have fond memories, and for those of you who've never been to them, it seems a sort of odd thing for a U.S. Senator to be talking about. But honestly, the amount of time and effort we spend celebrating sports uh, and athletes, and the amount of attention that gets for elementary and middle school students dwarfs, utterly dwarfs, the amount of attention and excitement we give to anything like engineering and science. And the LEGO Robotics League, for example, uh, has done an amazing job of exciting and engaging thousands of young people. There's companies excited about investing in this field, there's educational institutions trying to work on it, but we haven't yet made it broadly effective and accessible, and that's something my predecessor, Senator Kaufman, uh, is working hard on. He's leading the STEM Council for Delaware and I think has some very good policy ideas about how to do this from industry to university uh, to K-12 education. Thanks for the question. So, I've been, uh, I think you've sort of revived my entire week and maybe month with such a, a really insightful and optimistic view really of our ability to do this and I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, you know, with you and Senator Rubio working together, Senator Warner, Senator Moran, that you know, maybe this is the dawn of, a, of an era of innovation bipartisanship that we can move some things down the field. So please join me in thanking uh, Senator Warner. So if I could add.